Okay, so we're well into the Romantic era, mid 19th century. We'll take a look at some basic Romantic novels um, and writing with James Fenimore Cooper. Um, and we've also taken a look at, at one of the most well known kind of subsets of the Romantic era, which is the Transcendental Movement with Emerson and Thoreau. Now we're taking a look at another subset, which is a little more amorphous than Transcendentalism uh, this idea of sentimentalism. Sentimental novel, we'll see a lot of different names for it. We'll take a look at a couple. But again, this is a subset of the Romantic era. It, it comes into existence within the Romantic era um, and stays within those confines, but it just has some unique characteristics unto itself. Um, and one thing I find here, more so than with transcendentalism, again, is a lot of uh, disagreement about what's sentimental, what's not. Um, it's just one of those things literature professors spend their time doing, is disagreeing about these things. The sentimental novel really comes into existence like so much other stuff in, in, in Europe really in the late 18th century. Um, and it's not until really kind of the mid 19th century that it really starts to develop and take shape in its own kind of unique American form. Uh, so you can see here <clears throat> a number of different quote unquote sentimental novels um, from Britain. It's probably kind of one of the most common ones, although it started really in Germany. Um, and what you'll notice here obviously is that there is a lot of overlap. And Radcliffe, for example, is generally classified not as a sentimentalist, but as a gothic writer. Uh, <clears throat> Samuel Richardson, Lawrence Stern, again, they fit the model, or most models of the sentimental novel. And so it's worth kind of taking a look at some of these well-known novels to see and think about how they might fit into this larger idea of sentimentalism. In America, we get a much more, I think, focused set. And again, these are very small lists um, of just a few examples of Kind of well-known sentimental novels. One thing you should kind of note here is the number of male authors writing quote-unquote sentimental novels in Britain and the number of female authors writing those in America. One thing you, we're going to see here in just a minute is how women in America really, as readers, really helps define this subset or the genre, whatever you want to call it. And so it's worth kind of taking a look at that. So, early 19th century or so, again, we've talked about all kind of the political and social changes taking place now that America has settled down, become a country, uh, started to spread out, uh, fought some wars, made some progress here and there. Um, <clears throat> but society more and more within America is finally starting to kind of settle down and take some kind of shape. Really, leading into the Revolutionary War, it's kind of cobbled together. There's still colonists, there's still kind of settlers. Um, now more so, we're seeing these, these towns, these cities kind of form, and society itself, and culture, is really kind of coming into existence. And with that society, obviously, we get a lot of ideas about gender. And the ideas about gender that take shape at this time are things that are still with us uh, today, the idea of the differences between the genders. What really comes into existence uh, mid, early to mid 19th century is what's called the idea of separate spheres. And basically, you kind of recognize this once you start talking about it, because again, it's still something that exists in our, our society today to a great extent. Basically, it said men existed in one sphere of society, women existed in another sphere of society. It's probably pretty easy for you to figure out which of those there are. Men existed really and were meant for the external world, a sphere outside of the home. And this was a dangerous place. This was a corrupt place. This was a place full of deceit and lies. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't a place full of women. It was, it was dangerous and risky. And so men were meant in the minds of, of people at this time to, to exist and work within that external world or that sphere. And women were obviously meant, according to this way of thinking, to exist within this internal sphere, in, within the home. Right? So like I said, we still see this even today. Um, there have been some changes. We've, we've evolved a little bit in our thinking, but this is still really with us. The home was a place of safety. The home was a place of comfort. The home was a place of morality and ease. And so you really saw this idea that men and women existed in two very separate spheres. They overlapped in some ways. They interacted, obviously, um, but they, they existed almost in these two different worlds. <clears throat> This is really more than just a basic separation, though. And you can see that, I think, really illustrated by these, these images. Um, the real idea here is that, again, men went out into the world, which was dangerous, which was full of deceit and lies. They had to, they had to work, they had to earn money, um, they had to make things and move society along. 
But obviously, they did that at their own, the risk of their own moral center, their souls, really. And so they needed a way to kind of recuperate and recover. And that was the purpose, really, of the home. Men would go out into this dangerous world, and then they would come back and be refreshed, be renewed, um, be purified almost um, by the moral center provided by the woman in the house. And you can really see that again in these two images, especially in the one with uh, the father kind of leaning over that, that doorway. You can see the separation that's right there, right? He's separated really from his family. And you can see in both the way the women are inside looking out. They're on the edge of the outside world, but they're still inside and they're keeping their children inside. And both of these really illustrate this idea of, of spheres, um, of what the home is for and what the dangers of the out outside world were like. So, Compare this now to one of those main ideals of the Romantic era, specifically with the Romantic hero, um, about how the Romantic hero feels about society. The Romantic hero fears and despises society, he sees it as a place full of corruption, he sees it as a place that, that really kind of turns men evil. And what, is the, what does the Romantic hero do in order to escape those evils? He flees to nature, to be purified, to be renewed, to find his morality. So this isn't so different, right? We just moved the idea of nature, of finding some clarity in the forest, into uh, the household. So obviously, as this way of social thinking develops, we start to see literature that does the same thing. And so like when I said earlier that sentimental literature in America, I think, is much more uh, heavily feminine, it's because these two things were taking shape at the exact same time. And so we get this idea of sentimental literature, it's often called domestic fiction, or quite simply just women's fiction. Uh, not only was it appealing to and trying to reinforce this, this way of thinking in society, but we also had, again, the society settling down with uh, people's roles being more well-defined, with, with uh, the need to expand and kind of uh, uh, work the land settling a little bit. Um, we started to see more and more women with leisure time. They were at home, they were taking care of the kids, they were doing all those really stereotypical um, womanly things, again, according to this way of thinking back then. Um, and they had more and more time to do other things as well. And so one thing they really started to do a whole lot more than they had in the past was to read. And so not only do we have this society which is trying to define this role for women, and not only do we have this literature which really speaks to the emotional, which again is a sphere kind of held for women, in this way of thinking, but we've got women with a whole lot more time to read. So we've got this female readership. And so it's all kind of working together um, to develop what we really see as, as, as sentimental literature in America. So you can see from this description here, this is by Nina Bond, who's, who's a very famous and, and uh, important literary scholar, especially of, of uh, women's literature, uh, the way she describes the, the basic plot outline of, of what she calls women's fiction, uh, domestic fiction. And as you kind of take a look at that there, think again about how it kind of mirrors and also how it maybe differentiates a little bit from that typical plot uh, we might see with the romantic hero. Um, again, think about Nanny Bumpo as the kind of ideal, the, the epitome of the romantic hero. Think about how his story matches or doesn't match with this idea of the sentimental female hero. Obviously, if you're going to speak to women, if you're going to make emotional appeals, if you're going to try to tug at the heartstrings, um, there's probably a few better ways to do that uh, than to focus on a, a very common motif in sentimental domestic women's fiction, whatever you want to call it, which is the, the dead child, the death of the child. Uh, we see it, obviously, in Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, with Little Eva. You see it here with a poem uh, by Harry Beecher Stowe as well um, about the death of, of one of her children. So it's, it's a very common theme, and we can obviously see why it would appeal to us at a time when childbirth uh, and being young is still a very dangerous thing. Um, children die fairly regularly. Again, it's getting better by the mid-19th century, but it's still a very, very dangerous time of life. Um, and so the death of a child is a very common, common occurrence, uh, something a lot of women would have experienced. And so, again, it's, it's a very obvious way to kind of, kind of appeal to women readers um, by talking about something that either they've experienced or that they're worried about. So 
to kind of switch gears just a little bit, but you'll see how this kind of fits together here. We saw back, you know, about a uh, hundred years earlier with Equiano's narrative, how he and eventually other uh, slaves would make these uh, abolitionist appeals, these anti-slave appeals, by adopting and modifying, adopting and adapting, really, uh, a very popular literary genre. Equiano took the captivity narrative, which was so popular in the early Americas, and turned it into the slave narrative. and did that in order to speak out about and bring awareness of the plight of people who have been enslaved, right? and speak out about the problems of slavery. He started doing that, and other people did it as well. We see the same thing happen with the sentimental novel and the domestic novel. Um, you probably remember this from your freshman uh, composition class. A long time ago, Aristotle gave us three basic rhetorical modes, three ways to really make an argument uh, and to convince somebody or to persuade somebody uh, to act a certain way. Uh, he said there was the logical appeal, the ethical appeal, and the emotional appeal, logos, ethos, and pathos. So we saw it in the Enlightenment, obviously, it was most, one of the things that was most important to them was logic and reason. And so it makes sense that someone like Epimiano writing in the time would make a very logical-based uh, appeal, something about the rights of all people, about equality, about uh, the very kind of clear-cut differences between right and wrong. And that did a lot of work, and worked very well uh, at the time. But as we move into an era where writers and readers are thinking more about emotion than they are about logic, uh, we see this shift. Instead of making a logical appeal about the horrors of slavery, why not make an emotional appeal about the horrors of slavery? And so again, we basically see the same thing. They take uh, an existing and popular literary format um, and use it to make the anti-slavery, the abolitionist argument. So we see a big shift from rationality, the rationality of the Enlightenment, to sentimentality. And again, we see that most clearly with Uncle Tom's Cabin. Again, the kind of uh, mythical story is that when Abraham Lincoln met Harry Beecher Stowe, he said, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. But again, Uncle Tom's Cabin and Equiano's narrative were trying to do the same thing. They had the same goal. They just took two very different methods, two different very approaches to attain that goal. And so we see sympathy, the sympathetic, the sentimental, um, become a, a political, a rhetorical, an argumentative device. The problem with that, and again, we see it with Uncle Tom's Cabin, and it becomes a very common criticism, not just with Uncle Tom's Cabin, but with other <clears throat> emotional appeals about slavery, is that in order to criticize slavery at an emotional level, you have to show the slave as a victim. There's really no other way to do it. Right? So again, it's, it's, it's built in, the problem is built into the method. And again, obviously, the, the criticism is that it's constantly showing slaves as victims. It's constantly showing African Americans as victims. And so one criticism of this, this mode of writing, this, this approach to fighting against slavery, is that it's, it's creating this stereotype, which again is still with us today in a lot of ways, of the African American as a victim. Um, as with much of, of Harry Beecher Stowe's attempts to describe the worst aspects of slavery, uh, it leads to uh, a portrayal of love or the creation of the, these racist stereotypes. Right? Again, we see that with Uncle Tom and how that name has become a criticism. Um, we see it with uh, some of the other languages, we see it with some of the other portrayals like Sambo. Um, again, those, those were created in order to fight against slavery and obviously the racist system of slavery. And yet at the same time, they've also created these stereotypes which are used uh, by racists to defend their, their beliefs. Uh, and so again, it, it's a very problematic approach. It had its effects. Uh, it worked very well in a lot of ways. It raised a lot of awareness to the horrors of slavery. Um, and again, it did it in a way that was much more effective to this large readership by appealing to their emotional aspects, by talking about questions of religion and family, as opposed to rights and equality. But it also had some serious problems as well. So the, the, the sentimental novel, especially in the political sense, is always going to be a fairly problematic um, and difficult thing. Okay, so that's a real quick kind of overview of sentimentality and how it kind of grows out of and, and fits into that larger romantic era. 
So thanks once again for watching and see you in class.